Welcome to the new. Every experience with God's Word promises to be refreshing and transformational. Receive today's message with high expectations as it brings power, light, and a fresh anointing to your life. Oh, thank you, Lord. Just one passion, one purpose. To know you more and more When I know you I'll find me Just one passion One purpose To know you more and more Oh God, when I know No life outside you There's no one beside you Let me know you more and more Cause when I know you I'll find me Father we thank you for calling us to be your chosen children for calling us into your purpose, for making us in your image and crafting us after your own very dear son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for our lives and we thank you for tonight. I pray that your word will come swiftly by the power of the Spirit of God, ministering to every heart, touching everybody in their place of need and ministering life, transformation and revelation in the name of Jesus Christ. We are prayed. Amen. Good evening, everybody, once again. I trust your Tuesday has been amazing. I want you to comment. You know where you are joining us from on the comment section. Say hello to everyone. It's the new. We are the new and we love this church. Just come on, put something up there. Say hello. Say hi. You know, connect to service. How are you feeling today? Even though you might not be live in church today, I want you to still stay connected, stay focused as we journey in purpose tonight. Hallelujah. So tonight we'll be talking about purpose, and I'm sure you've heard it a lot before. And uh, before I proceed, I would like to thank my father, my pastor, Pastor Shola. I want everybody to say, Pastor Shola, we love you on the comment section right there. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I do not take it for granted. And um, I thank God for this season that we are in in the new. It's a season like no other. I'm sure you can also attest to that fact that God is doing something amazing in our lives. And that brings us to the question of purpose. I'm sure you've heard it said before that when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse is inevitable. But how much more so when the purpose of a life is not known? What kind of abuse would come out of it? You see, so many of us have normalized some level of abuse where our lives are concerned because any life out of purpose is being abused. And, you know, there's something here that many people delight in the abuse of their lives and we have found so many excuses for the way we live our lives in these days we, 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 we live in a life full of so many contexts and we have to be very very careful as Christians because there are so many things that you can give meaning to that you can give reason to if you just create a context for it you know what used to be known as selfishness has been given a careful context and now it's known as self-love what used to be known as lust has been given a context now and it's known as um, liberation and there are so many so many different things that are just being contextualized and just being given meaning whereas it's just abuse of purpose and I remember in, in secondary school I used to enjoy economics a lot and there's something I remember we used to call um, uh, the laws of demand or different kinds of demand there was one that was called composite demand if I remember correctly and I know it was used to describe something that could be used to produce different things. An example will be wheat, which can, which can be used to produce bread. Um, these days you can use it for biofuel. You also have uh, steel. You can use steel to produce automobiles. You can use it to produce different forms of things like the stands on which the cameras here are, are, are upon, you know, all of all those things. You also have land. 
which can be used for farming, which can be used for building real estate, and so many different options or opportunities to use these resources for. But one thing about that kind of demand is this. Once the demand for one particular use, land for example, if the demand for land for building houses should increase, it naturally reduces the quantity of land that we have for farming or vice versa. If the demand for land for farming increases, it reduces the quantity of land that is made available for housing, for real estate and stuff. And I want you to recognize tonight that there's a composite demand for your life. And the same way it applies to all of all these things that have been mentioned. The more of the supply of your life you give to one thing, the less of it you can provide for the other. And I'm sure you must have guessed by now, and I'm talking about the use of your life for God or for the devil. Now, it might seem like, okay, we're always bringing these two options, God or the devil. It seems like God is just one narrow path and it's straight. And then the devil just has so many options. Well, it might seem like he has so many options. The reason is because he doesn't need... It doesn't have any need for specificity. It is something that is made for a purpose that has precision. If I'm creating a telephone, for example, I know the intent for which I have created that thing, and it has to follow that pattern, has to follow that line. But any other person using it for any other use could use it however they please. But one thing remains for certain. If that phone is not performing the function for which it was created, no matter how that phone feels about itself, no matter how... how how passionate the phone is about recording music no matter how passionate the phone is about taking pictures if it does not make phone calls it ceases to be a phone it might be any other thing it might be a recording instrument it might be a music player it might be a a, a picture gallery but it ceases to be a phone and who defines those terms the maker of the phone or the owner of the phone So the question I want to ask you is, who is the owner of your life? And who defines the terms upon which you live your life? You don't live your life based on how you feel. You don't live your life based on what is interesting you in the moment. But have you taken time to ask, what exactly does the owner of my life require of me? Now, some things are called luxurious goods, luxury goods. and And we know some very famous fashion brands. And sometimes I ask myself, what exactly makes these precious things? What makes a diamond precious? What makes your designer uh, Louis Vuitton and all of all those things? What makes them more expensive than any other bag or shoe or anything? It's two things. Number one, the value that the owner attaches to it and the value that the producer attaches to it. Those are the things that give those, not the value that they have in and of themselves, but the value that the person who possesses them attaches to those things and you have those kind of valuables because of the status that it gives you in society or the impression of you that it gives to other people all i have said now has nothing to do with that particular material it has to do with the impression of the owner of it so the question is what is the impression of the owner of your life about you and so many so many times we get ourselves into the rat race we know we are pursuing our ambitions you know we are trying to find our passion this this is very very interesting words that we use trying to find our passion the things that interest us the things that you know get us up and going and all of that but if those things have not been submitted at the altar of sacrifice before god you are just running your own cause so quickly i would like to get into the depth of it there are five particular areas where i feel that it is very important for us as believers to know the purpose for which these aspects of our lives, of our existence are meant for. I think I've already started speaking on the first one. The first thing we have to identify is the purpose for our lives. And the purpose for our life is very, very simple. The purpose of our life is to know Jesus and to make him know, and to make him known. I'll say it again. The purpose of our lives is to know Jesus and to make him known. I'd like to open a portion of scripture. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 17. I hope you have your Bibles with you. If you are driving, you can just listen. I'll be reading it out. If you are watching, I believe it will be displayed. But I want to read from John chapter 17 quickly and verse 3. 
It says here that now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Like I said, the purpose of your life is to know him. The second one is to make him known. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. It says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good, to do good works. Okay, I have here. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. So the purpose of your life precedes your existence. It precedes you. It precedes your ambitions. It precedes your passion. It precedes the things that you feel are those things that fuel your excitement. It was preordained by God. Remember, like that expensive shoe, expensive bag that, you know, so many of us want to have or already have. What makes those things valuable, again, is the impression the owner has of them. If anybody is cleaning the streets with a Chanel jacket or something, it just goes to show it's possible anybody can do that. Probably it got stolen or something and the person who has it doesn't know the value of it or it got damaged or something. But nothing in this life is valuable in that sense. Money is not valuable. It's, it's just the value that the users and the owners of it attach to it that makes currency currency. That makes anything anything. That makes anything of worth of worth. So this night I would like to remind you of the fact that your impression of yourself doesn't really count on the grand scheme of things. The most important, the most important decision, the most important uh, opinion rather, the most important opinion is the one of God. The opinion God has of you. Praise God. And in making God known, there are some things that we must do. We must preach the word of God in its truth. We live in a generation where we are we feel intimidated and oppressed when there's a little bit of you know um, um, outcry or people people start complaining that oh you these Christian people you've come again and stuff like that. And I'm reminded of the fact that we are preserving something precious. And it seems as though in this generation we've forgotten the bad fact that we have a legacy to protect. We must remember that the gospel that we live in our generation is what the generations after us are going to meet. Now, I want you to think of the implication of that. If we water down the gospel in our generation, what the future generations coming after us will have is a watered down generation, watered down version of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Imagine the quality we will be meet, missing out on right now if those, the patriarchs that have come before us had given into pressure. Or do you think that people were not talking about them in their own age? Or you think people were not saying their own was too much? Or people did not think that they were crazy? Or that they were out of their minds? Or that they were just fanatics about spooky stuff that nobody cared about? But they didn't look at those things. If you check everywhere throughout history, any culture, any practice that has stood the test of time, that has stayed until this, and is being practiced in the manner and the approach in which it is supposed to. I know there's been a lot of evolution in culture, but if you look at uh, monarchical systems, kingdoms that have been sustained till now, you have to have some form of, I would like to call it stubbornness, or stronger as we like to call it. You must have that level of never say die and, you know, unwavering stance on the integrity of what it is that you stand for. And remember that it's not about your opinion. Your opinion is not what makes the word of God true. It is true because that is what, that is what it is. The truth. So the truth must be preserved in our generation for what it is. Another thing we must do is that we must defend the integrity of the gospel for the generation. I've mentioned that for the generations to come and the purpose of our lives. After all is said and done is death. Death to self. Death to our own personal pleasures. Death to the things that we indulge ourselves in. Because to live is Christ and to die is gain. Every single day we must die to self to fulfill this purpose. That is the purpose of our lives. The second aspect that we must really understand where purpose is concerned is the purpose of Kairos moments. Now we've been hearing this. Kairos actually means uh, a moment in time. 
in, in Greek, it actually means, it literally means time or seasons as it were. We need to understand the importance of seasons. Because many times you just get excited, you know, when uh, amazing conferences like the next conference come about and we are so stirred and inspired and there's a fire burning inside of us. But then we don't recognize the reason for which this stirring has been placed upon us. I would like to show something in, in scripture that talks about this. In first, first Kings chapter 19, I'll be reading quickly from verse 1 to 8. Could you please quickly help me display that? First Kings 19 from verse 1 to, 1 to 8. You must understand that Kairos moments are for instructions and impartation. They are for instructions and impartation. So if all that you took out of the next conference is just the excitement that you felt when you were in service or when hands were being laid upon you, your work is not complete yet. There are instructions and impartation for exploits that must follow this thing. Okay, now, now let's quickly go through this. It says, And Heab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and without how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Let's go to the next verse. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow. Verse 3. And when he saw that he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah and left his servant there. Move to the next one. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under the juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die. Now, here, here is where we are. Sometimes we make some funny requests of God. Look at what Elijah was saying here. He, asked, he was asking God that he wanted to die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Move on to the next verse. Now, And he lay and slept under a juniper tree. Behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Here, I said, they are for instructions and impartation. When, when you receive impartation, there are instructions that must back up the hands that have been laid on you to actualize the purpose for which God has called you in that season. We do not create chaos moments. They happen by the timing of the Spirit. But we must be prepared so that when these moments are occurring, we are partakers in such moments. Our prayer does not orchestrate or concoct a chaos moment. No, it doesn't do that. He places us at the pinnacle of these things so that we can receive from God when these things happen. Now, back, back to the story. As he lay and slept, okay, so the angel came. Next verse. Verse 6. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked and coals and crews of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and lay down again. Elijah ate to his own personal satisfaction. Move to the next verse. Then the angel of the Lord came again. Now, Sometimes when we pray, you know we always say this thing where we say that um, pray until you feel a satisfaction. See, it's not your own impulses that will tell you when you've prayed enough. Or, where, or, where you, or when you've broken through in the place of prayer. You must, you must come by the impulse of the Spirit. Not just how you feel in that moment. Elijah ate to his own satisfaction. But then the angel woke him up again and said, the second time, touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for thee. You don't know the destination you are going to, but God does. So it's the one who will prepare you for where you are going to. Move to the next verse. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mountain of God. He didn't know he had a 40-day journey ahead of him. If he had stayed with what he ate the first time, I wonder maybe he would have lasted just 20 days. But we must wait for the instruction of the Spirit of God. Amen. Quickly, I would like to move to the next one. We must also understand the purpose of the supernatural. We must understand the purpose of the supernatural. Thank God for the heritage that we have. Not a lot of people have these things that some of us take for granted. I, I kid you not. The supernatural is for two things. For evangelism and for edification. The gifts of the Spirit and the manifestation of the power of God must equip us for two things evangelism and edification of the body now if and sometimes we pray that god I, i'm not seeing manifestations of your power in my life and stop we must remember that these signs shall follow those who believe why because jesus told us what to do for these signs to follow us in mark 16 verse 15 to 18 we must remember the first instruction that jesus gave before yes mark Mark 16, 15 
to 18. Yes, the initial instruction before the signs followed was this. Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I'm sure you know the rest of it, so let, don't, don't let me go there. He eventually promised us the signs that we're going to follow those who believe. Here's the thing. Maybe you don't need to pray for power to fall on you again. Maybe what you need to pray for is a burden to reach out for, to souls for Christ. Because when you reach out to souls for Christ, there will be a need for the manifestation of that power that you seek. There will be a need for the manifestation of that hearing that you want to be in tune with, with, with what the Spirit of God is saying per time. There will be a quickening inside your hearts. There will be so many sick people for you to heal. Maybe if you prayed for that, you will see transformation that you really want to see. The second one is for edification, like I mentioned, which is for the body. We know that the gifts of pastors, evangelists, prophets, you know, teachers, pastor, every all, all, all of the ministry gifts are given, as we call them, ministry gifts, because they are actually given to equip us for the work of the ministry. So there's also an edification involved. So it's not just for us to come together, meet in service, you know, and just feel that's that stirring that we feel when we spend quality time in prayer, and it seems like you're on top of the world. It's not just supposed to crash back down being contained inside your body. It is supposed to be dispensed to the world around you. So if you are the only one feeling the charge of the supernatural and it's not being imparted into any other life around you, you are just turning on a generator and it's not connected to any power. So it's not powering anything. Just the generator itself is feeling the heat and just, you know, consuming all the power and burning the fuel. But you must be plugged to other so many people need the anointing that we carry and in this season we will be stepping into encounters that will lift us up into the place that God sees us in the name of Jesus hallelujah another very important purpose we must understand in our lives is the purpose of prayer we belong to a praying church and I know that we all know that prayer is something that we give very very detailed attention to in the new. Now, this for me is very, very personal because I used to believe that prayer was a calling for some people and that, you know, some of us are more predisposed to the word. So when we study the word, we can break it down, we can cook it, divide it, serve it, dissect it, all of all those things. So those that are given, so we just need to garnish it with prayer here and there and stuff. Imagine the lies that the devil can create inside your heart. But then we must follow the example of our example, Jesus Christ himself. Because he's the one who modeled prayer for us. A very interesting story in the Bible always reminds me of the importance of not just praying, but tarrying in the place of prayer. And we might have read it so many times and missed out on some of the juice in it. But I would like to take you to it once again. Um, let's go to Matthew 26 from verse 34 Matthew 26 from verse 34 now this is the story of Jesus and the three disciples when he was going to to get some money to pray first of all um, I'll start from no 34 Matthew 26 verse 34 first of all here Jesus told Peter something he said verily I say unto you that this night before the cock crows thou shalt deny me thrice now hear what Peter said let's move to the next verse Peter said unto him though I should die with thee yet will I not deny thee likewise also said all the disciples and sometimes this is where we are with God our, our, our heart is sincere our zeal is true you know like I was I was very very sincere with my belief thank God for my life our, our heart is very very true Peter says, see, I, me, deny you, I can't. I would rather die with you, sir. Now, let's move on. Jesus, having known what was going to happen to him, they moved on. No, no, you don't have to follow that. Let me, let me see the next place. And, okay, yes, 36, please stay there. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. Now he took him and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray yonder. Then, verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Now, sorry, stay there. Sometimes you feel a feeling inside you you don't know how to describe. Let's learn from Jesus here. 
what did Jesus do when he began to feel sorrowful and very heavy? He didn't start to panic or start to quiver or shake. What did he do? Verse 38. Then he said unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. Remember, Peter was part of these people who had boasted in the fact of his love for Jesus Christ, even unto death. Let's watch what happens next. Verse 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Next verse. Now, it seemed like a simple prayer. See how long he prayed it for. And he came unto the disciples and find them asleep and said unto Peter. He said to Peter specifically, Could you not watch with me for one hour? And if you study this story, you realize that Jesus observed three watches. This was the first watch. Now, if you are always wondering, why are you shouting, pray for one hour, pray for one hour. This is where it comes from. Could you not watch with me for one hour? Then he said, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. If you remember what Jesus told Peter, you understand why he was telling telling him this here. Move to the next verse. It says he went away again the second time and prayed. Now Jesus, Jesus, oh, Jesus himself did not end his own prayer after one hour because the burden had not left. Again, he said, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, that will be done. Move to the next one. He came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Move again to the next verse. He left them and went away again, prayed the third time, saying the same words. Move to the next verse. Then commented to the disciples and said unto them, Sleep now and take rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of his sinners. Now, we know about the denial of Peter. Now, there's something I, I want to show us in the book of... Uh, uh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll get back to that. What I wanted to show us was where the Roman soldiers came to, came to pick Jesus. And Peter's zeal, remember he had that zeal for Christ. He saw, some, he saw one of the guys advancing to come and pick him up. And out of his zeal, his excitement, his desire to please Jesus, based on his own understanding, having not processed it in the place of prayer, went and cut off the ear of one of one of those people. I wish I could have found it, so we'll see it in the Bible. But I, I'm sure some of us are familiar with the story. But what did Jesus say? Jesus took that ear and placed it back and then told him that this is the will of the Father because he had processed it in the place of prayer. In closing, I would like you to know this. The purpose of your life is not just for you and to please yourself. There is a purpose also for the wealth that we have. It is for kingdom assignment and for fulfilling the will of God for, for upon the earth in this season. Nothing is perpetuated just because people want it to. Go and find out. People that have real wealth, they are propelling agendas. That ideologies is what they are financing, not just their own personal ambitions. So right now, I want us to lift our hands and pray that God in this season... I want to identify your intentions for for, for my life. I want to live according to your will. Not something that I have concocted for myself. Not something I believe is your desire for my life. But what you want for me, oh God. I want to please you in spirit and in truth. I want a burden for your cause that will bring me to my knees. That would humble me. That will break my flesh and elevate my spirit. Because the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. And where we win and take care of the flesh is in the place of prayer. Lord, I want what is filled in your heart to fill my heart, oh God. I want a burden for your cause. Come on, commit yourself to God right now. Ambra city pan the sufric at the setila jeda bara da fola de bedi geda bahaya. Don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. Zene malo folitiya. Jeka take pere dehi. Eshe perune kila mahaku de beninesi. Zendo pori ke tege de gebera di ge zuvele dia da haya. Zebendo baranda si de koboro shete kere di da 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 haya. Le barako satali gebando sufric and the lido si zede le gira bahaya. And they feel Zuzze Telegera de Shedebera Dufa, as Jedebera Tila de Libia Sozomanesia, 
Ebene no mora si fele de brekete le vieto so. Ekrete le beno so foro de gesatale gada baro fele niso. Ekret estole. Ekres estole. Come on, press in. Press in. Zomanali katabosi. Esso paradigadakia. Le baro sateni katali monoboshe de gilabanis. Ekriatora besiki bere du gabahal. Isa maruko sege de gile paradigazai. Le do secre in do stoka pane. Kinam an ido pore si katali endo kurashet ikate karat ufre ilidaba korine sege jendo baruke tagide kabaruke teli gendo so broke teli kerata dida atele kur estila as ekora basanda kilebenosi jende manakubarat es indo kiatale venesik ikos te kelebando kure bedakan de sule endo rasendor andil sti katalu marati gadai leto par isto par seteli grade ganose embarada bandos e garabanda sande minasole i jalabatoko pades ate ikiako kali zoman eka zenopaki kat ukara di belekede zenukiria tai Ekor eshibar atu barata telia barata osa. Iri esude ke barana no selia talebisi. Iri ata para siata. Yes, you are the Lord. Come on, lift your hands. Lift your hands. Most high. Yes, you are the Lord. Mandala bahaya. Zema rahaya. Most high, yes, you are the Lord. Manana Mahasi. Most high, yes, you are the Lord. Mara Ashte Yedala. Most high. Above all other gods, we lay our crowns and worship you. Oh, believe, sir, there is no other God. And worship you. Oh, glorious God, we praise your name. We lay our crowns and worship. Come on, consecrate yourselves to God right now. Esso feretili ki barade ki abaya. Lebre isokaya. We lay our lives down. We lay it all down at your feet, O oh God. We lay it all down at your feet, O oh God. We lay it all down at your feet, O oh God. We lay it all down at your feet, O oh God. Oh, glorious God. We praise your name. We lay our crown and worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Such a tangible presence. Bless the be of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You are good and you are kind to us. You are good and you are kind to us. And we worship you. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Let your name be glorified. Let your name be lifted. Let your name be glorified. Let your name be lifted. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'd like to appreciate my father <laughs> for this opportunity. Uh, let's celebrate P.S. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir, for this opportunity. And let's celebrate Mrs. O as well. And 
Pastor Dito and Mrs. A. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And let's celebrate ourselves for, for being here tonight. For being here tonight. Hallelujah. Deacon Elias preached everything, actually. You know, <laughs> he has said everything. But, you know, I'm going to pick up from where he stopped. He spoke about Jesus. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. One thing you should realize about the life of Christ was that when he was on earth, on so many occasions, you will find that Jesus went to a secluded place to be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Jesus always went to a secluded place to be with the Lord. Let's open to the book of Mark, chapter 1, verse 35. He says, and in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Hallelujah. Now, let's open to Mark 14, 32. Give you about four scriptures. Mark 14. Yes. So Jesus said to them, and they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I shall pray. Jesus did not do parapet prayer. He did not take every one of them into the place of prayer. He told them, you stay here. Let me go and pray. All right. Let's open to the book of Luke chapter 4 verse 42. Yes. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place. And the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. This scripture was basically saying Jesus went to a secluded place. People came to meet him at the secluded place. Hallelujah. Let's open one more scripture. Matthew 14, 13. Matthew 14, 13. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by sheep to a desert place apart. Can you see again? Jesus went to a secluded place apart. Jesus went to a secluded place apart. Now, let's open to the book of John chapter 5 verse 19 to 22. I want to show you what people see on the outside. This is what Jesus did. He went to a secluded place. But this is what people saw on the outside. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, this also doeth the Son likewise. Please give me NKJV. Yes, thank you. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than this that you may marvel. We are going to 22. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Hallelujah. If you go to the book of Romans chapter 8, it says that the creature is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Alright? Look at what John 5, 22 says. It says, For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Let's open to the book of Ephesians 2, Chapter 10. The scripture says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, beforehand, that we should walk in them. Hallelujah. Open to Ephesians, um, 2 Timothy. 
the scripture that says that who has called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose second timothy Second Timothy says that who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. I have one more Bible verse, but before I go there, before I go there, let's go back to Genesis. Hallelujah. What happened in the Garden of Eden? You know, God created Adam and Eve, right? You know, when God was going to create the plants, he spoke to the ground. And the plants came out of the ground. When he was going to create the fishes, I mean, the, 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 the bodies in the water, he spoke to the water. But when it was time to create man, God then spoke to himself. So question, if you take fish out of water, what happens to it? It struggles, then it dies, Right? Does it die immediately? No. It struggles first, then it dies. If you take plants out of the ground, if you uproot a plant, what happens to it? It struggles, then it dies. So, if you take man out of God, what happens to man? So, what was God's intent when he created man? No. Before Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. Right? Adam called whatever. Adam called lion, lion, because that was what God called it. Adam was aligned with God. So whatever God was calling something was what Adam called it. The king earlier already touched on something like that. When he said that, that this is a chair doesn't mean someone cannot stand on it right and the person standing on it if you ask the person why are you standing on it he's going to say i need it for my work most likely now if everybody continues standing on the chair the in quote purpose of that chair would have been defeated would have been twisted now if that man stands on the chair if a man stands on the chair and what he does all the days of his life is stand on the chair and he gives birth to a son right and the son sees the father what the son sees his father doing all the time is stand on the chair stand on the chair now what happens the mind of the son is already twisted so when he sees a chair like this he believes the chair is for So how do you then define purpose outside of God? How do you define purpose outside of the creator? You know when I was uh, thinking about um, when I was thinking about it on my way to on my way to uh, on, my, on my way here I realized that the devil is actually fulfilling purpose, you know. The devil is fulfilling purpose. The Bible says for thou art created right all things are for thy pleasure they are our well created so every sin every sin God created everything everything including you how is it that when you are going to define who you are you define your purpose outside of your creator. Now, when before Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, whatever God called anything is what they called it. So that situation you are going through right, right now, you should call it whatever God calls it. That is that is the ideal. That is the true state. That is that is the truth. Every other thing is a lie. That is the truth. So what happened when they ate of the fruit? The first thing they did, if you check it, 
you check it, the first thing they did was they, they started they started to determine what was good and what was bad for them. That was when they realized that, oh, I am naked. I need to cover up myself. That was an initiative outside of God. And what happens? What has happened to the earth thus far? You realize that the problem we still have till today is that what I call good is what you call evil. So we always clash. So the scripture now says that in the end, at the end of times, nations rise up against nations, kings against kings. Why? Because what they call good, what somebody calls good is clashing with what somebody calls evil. But we have to have an anchor for things to work, for things to go back to its state. We have to have an anchor. We have to have a standard. We have to have a truth. And guess what? This truth is a person. So I even want to say to you this evening that purpose is not what you become. Purpose is not what you become. Purpose is a state of being. When we talk about purpose, it's a state of being. And guess what? God's purpose for you is to be a son. Hallelujah. God's purpose is for you is to be a son. Let's read John 5 verse 30. John 5 verse 30. Media, please help me. It says, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Let's read, in, read it in Amplified Version. Amplified Version. Look at what it says. I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bidding to decide. As the voice, voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right, just righteous. Because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself. My own aim. My own purpose. But only the will and the pleasure of the Father who sent me. You know, when Adam and Eve had ate of the fruit and they were separated from God, man died. Then God now brought a restorative plan. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ. He sent his only son, Jesus. And guess what? Jesus walked on the earth fulfilling purpose. And if you check the life of Jesus, Jesus did not fulfill his own purpose, his own desire. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, not my will, but your will, O God. But how did it happen? How was Jesus able? Jesus, there's, there's, there's a place in the scripture where Jesus said that he had to cry to the one that is able to save him from himself. He had to cry to the one that is able to save him from death. How do you become a son? Because your purpose is to be a son. At the mouth of transfiguration, I mean, I was checking the meaning of transfiguration. It means change. Change. When Jesus started praying at the mount of transfiguration, Right, and it was transfigured during that period. That was when the heavens opened and said, This is my son. And in the Jewish culture, being a son is is a representative, is, is it means that this person can stand in my stead now. Like I don't have to be there. Once this person is here, he can handle it. That's what being a son is. But it happened in the place of prayer. 
when Jesus started praying, he was transfigured. He was changed. He was changed. He was changed. He was transfigured into that image. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He was transfigured into that image. You know, when I think about prayer, because that's where I'm going, that's that's point. Your purpose is not a what. Your purpose is a who. Do you understand? Purpose is not a what. Purpose is a who. Because even in this kingdom, the Bible says that when you pray, believe that you have, then you shall re- believe that you have received, then you shall have. So, in this kingdom, we first become bec- before we have. Do you understand? We we become. We enter a posture before before things. You know, just in the, in the, in the corporate space, right? As as you as you get promoted, at some point when you get to the level of the manager, some benefits come with it. Now you don't struggle. You don't go for those benefits. Just become the manager, and the benefits will come with it. So in in the kingdom, we we become then things. Then everything, you, I mean, the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God, and all things will be added unto you. You see, you become, then things will be, be added unto you. Then you start seeing the manifestations. You start seeing the manifestations. So when I think about prayer, you know, where is God? I like to use this illustration. Where is God in heaven? Where is Jesus? Seated at his right hand, right? Where is the Holy Spirit? Inside of you. <laughs> right? The Holy Spirit is inside of you. Now, every time that you now start doing this, you start seeing things that you what you are doing when you are doing that is that you are entering a meeting of the Trinity. Hallelujah, you don't get me. The Spirit of God is inside of you. God is in heaven. Jesus is by his side. So when you start praying in the Spirit, what you are doing is you are entering, you are entering a meeting of the Trinity. As you enter a meeting of the Trinity, so they start conversing. Oh, we want to do something in India. We want to do something in, 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 in Afghanistan. We want to do something in Nigeria. Then you start sharing and start converting what you are sharing in the Spirit into your mind. The light is is, is, is is placed on your mind. Then you interpret it into... It starts coming out as utterance. Then you start speaking over India. You start speaking over Nigeria. You start speaking over, over Afghanistan. That is the way to bring the will of God from heaven to earth. That is how to bring the will of God from heaven to earth. Let's read Romans chapter 8, verse 26. From verse 26. As I close. Romans 8 from verse 26. Let if andush the fathers carried ele palace get a belly to get a bit of ala palace get a feeling to show. Media help me. Romans, yes. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Keep going. Verse 27. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to what the will of God. Keep going. And we know that all saints work together for those who, for those who love God to those who are called according to my purpose. No, his purpose. But look at what happened first. In Romans chapter 8 verse 26, it says the Spirit helps our infirmities. I started talking about how when we pray in the Spirit, we enter into the meeting of the Trinity. That's what is happening in Romans chapter 8 verse 26. It's happening in Romans chapter 8 verse 26. It's happening in Romans chapter 8 verse 26. Go to 27 now. Oh, in 27, it's now saying that, oh, pray that there's peace in Nigeria. Pray that there's peace in, in Asia. Pray that there's peace in Russia. That is what is happening in Red SCKL in Romans 8, verse 27. Jebera is at two is here. Go to 28. 28. In the book of 
Romans chapter 8 verse 28, you start seeing that things are now aligning. Things are now happening physically. You have translated heaven into earth. We have translated heaven into earth. And that is the purpose of man on earth. The purpose of man on earth is for God to be able to perpetuate this earth. Hallelujah. It's for God to be able to perpetuate this earth. So God is looking for a people. Eli, Sifre, and the Sike. God is looking for a people. And we are that people. Red Esuka Paris. We are that people that will bring his purpose here on earth. The Bible says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. His will cannot be done on earth if there are no people to birth. His will cannot be done on earth. His purpose cannot be done on earth if there are no people to birth. So there's nothing like my purpose in this kingdom. It is his purpose. For we are his workmanship. His purpose. We have been created to do his will. Go to 29. Go to 29. 829. It says, look at it. It says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You know, I told you, the purpose is a who, not a what. Your purpose is to be a son. He has predestined you to be conformed into the image of his son. Because the earth is waiting for the manifestation of the son. God is not going to tell, he's not going to tell us, men, to replenish the earth if the earth is not diminishing already. Hallelujah. But we can't do this. We can't carry it out if we don't eat as shepilia, like Jesus, like Jesus, with, with in prayer. We can't do this if we don't, like Jesus, go to a secluded place and ekiri be east of ekedele feletist afila farate sikopato si teke koka parate tote jeto pidi nika koko pare teke si te kapale e ture ka te kuri ishte pare ito kapale feret iso praya then at some point like Jesus we will say have you seen the father have you seen me and you say you have not seen the father then he's sick need to be healed. Have you seen me? And you say, you have not seen the Father. Then Nigeria is going through a crisis. Hey, <laughs> have you seen me? And you, have, you say, you have not seen the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is how to walk in purpose. That is how to walk in purpose. You spend time in the place of prayer. Let God perpetuate you. Let His Spirit rest upon you. Let His Spirit breathe upon you. The kill is suffering in this year, and the CPU called your mind will interpret what is coming from the spirit, and we will implement on earth. That is how to walk in purpose. There is no purpose outside of God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Let's begin to pray. Let's begin to pray. That the eyes of our understanding, Ephesians 1 17 to 19, that the eyes of our understanding will be enlightened. That we may know far as seek a rabatana digeta baradega beledosia. Vrene roboshe prega deligiata rabadogo de vose. E baradaga rabataka rabatoko de losia. E rete tete te. E prasuke peridia sapari. E cropa socolia. For the next three minutes, pray. E romanantise. E crab ash de biro kuda takila baratele. Embre endo ruboshika paratea. Fara to koporo te ke sekeri da bara te karadisha. E doro do koporo te ko sekpili disia. Ikrab astupre ende seko para si ke pare sida asha bara te ge. E shopri ato ke te ge baru se ke pele disia. Indo pande si ka bahai. Lembera be deskabra ti da tole. E duri si ke para sa ge di isi kana nosa. E shopri e de galo ko pare. E do bara te ge te ge te ge he. E pre te ge pare te ko baso fele dio. Am porosua. Pray for the new. In the supra, in the secret, in the practice, that as a body will manifest the purpose of God on earth. 
as long as the new is on this earth we are going to take this earth for Christ with the spirit of might in a camber using a pre is to call and courage and boldness backed up with signs and with wonders. Lipre and to sumbre and to kele palatizo and no poro seke de de i raba sumbre and niya sasa e roba shople i data porsche i paro poro to sede ke de ziya i pre i seke le ando furot i shele liya sana siya. We hope you were greatly blessed by today's message because God still has so much He wants to share with you. So stay connected every week to experience uplifting and life-changing moments in His presence.